Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for OSC's community lecture series. My name is Chelsea and I am part of OSC's marketing team. Tonight, we will hear from Dr. Boyd Haynes, sports medicine physician and orthopedic surgeon about hip and knee replacements without cutting your muscle or your tendon. Dr. Haynes will be taking questions throughout the lecture tonight. So visual instructions about how to submit your questions are on the screen. For your privacy, questions are not public, and you may choose to remain anonymous when you submit your question. Before you begin, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about Dr. Haynes. He started at OSC at, uh, 29 years ago and serves as the president of Coastal Virginia Surgery Center, the new outpatient surgical center right next door to our main office. He has continued to be a pioneer in his field through outpatient and minimally invasive surgeries. Dr. Haynes enjoys mentoring students who are interested in pursuing a career in medicine playing volleyball, boating, fishing, and spending time with his wife and three kids, three children. Please welcome me in joining Dr. Haynes. Good evening, Dr. Haynes. Hi, thank you for introducing me. Yeah. Appreciate it. Hello, everybody. All right, we'll make sure we get Virginia Tech in the background over there. All right, that's my alma mater. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about hip and knee arthritis, basically. All right, and then um, we'll kind of go through some slides. If anybody's been to some of my lectures in the past, the treatment of arthritis up until you get to the time of surgery is fairly uh, consistent. So we'll kind of talk about the different things we, uh, we'll uh, be involved with here. Let me change that. So, so when we look here, um, uh, the osteoarthritis is the process of, of the breakdown of the articular cartilage of joints. That being said, if you look down here, this shiny white cartilage where that laser pointer is, is pretty normal cartilage. If you look over here, this defect is the cartilage is missing completely, and that's severe arthritis. When you get to that sort of level of arthritis, whether it's hip or knee, that's when knee replacement is uh, uh, considered. Uh, unfortunately, the process starts at age 25, all right? And things like age, obesity, injury, overuse, genetics, your job, all those things make a difference in how much arthritis you get and how quickly you get it. Right now, 63 million Americans have the diagnosis of arthritis in some form, and there's predicting by 2040 that'll be up to 78 million. So a significant portion of America. So here are some x-ray pictures I typically see when people come in the room. If you look on the uh, uh, x-ray on the left, you can see a gap right where that laser pointer is, and that's where uh, cartilage is. So it's not a true gap, all right? It's a space we see by x-ray, but that's cartilage space, which is not seen by the x-ray. If you look on the right, that gap is now gone. We typically term that uh, bone on bone arthritis, and that's when the cartilage is gone and it matches up to that picture I showed you just previously. So here's the x-ray of a hip, same sort of thing, right where my laser pointer is, there's a space between the bone, the pelvis bone up top, and the femur bone down here. That gap in and of itself, again, has cartilage in it. If you look over here where you have an arthritic hip, you see some gap here, but as you go towards the top right there, there is no gap left, which is again, back to bone on bone arthritis. So uh, here's some pictures of the same arthritic bone uh, beforehand, and this is now with the knee replacement in position. Here's a hip, and that's a hip replacement in position, all right? So that's what the components will look like once they get placed. So uh, we always treat arthritis typically non-surgically, uh, and when you get to the end of the path, that's when we decide on what surgery we do. So just here, which shows uh, lifestyle changes make a difference in the treatment of osteoarthritis. Um, so diet does make a difference and everybody's talked about weight as being part of it, all right? As you lose a pound of weight, basically it takes approximately four pounds of pressure off of your knee, particularly doing stair climbing, ascending and descending steps. If you use a walker or a cane or any sort of aid, it also helps unweight your leg and takes away some of that pressure. So this is the uh, gold in my orthopedic world. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or we abbreviate it and call it NSAIDs, all right? 
So the examples at the bottom are like they show, they're Advil and Aleve, all right? Those are the common ones, they're over the counter. You can get them pretty much anywhere in the world and they're a good drugs that work for this. So they reduce pain, swelling and inflammation, all right? That's their job. Arthritis is an inflammatory condition and these are anti-inflammatory. So I always say it's the right drug for the right condition, all right? Relief can take a while for that to work. So when you first start taking it, it may not make a difference in inflammation because it takes a couple of days to get into your system and start to work, all right? So the number one issue I see is right here with the non-steroidal drugs is that they can cause indigestion. So reflux or if you have GERD, any of those can get irritated by this. So you want to take it with food or milk and it seems to be better tolerated. If you get any sort of indigestion with these drugs, you should discontinue it and look for a new drug uh, or stop using them altogether. For the people that do have this issue, there are some gels down here. It says Voltaren gel, Pensed, Flector patch. And these are all sort of variations on drugs we've used in the past. I've tried them and I have not has as, had as good a success with these as I have with the drugs you take by mouth. Aspirin down here is a great anti-inflammatory agent. It's good for joint pain and inflammation, but the trouble is in order to get an effective dose of aspirin, you probably have to take 15 or 20 of those per day, and it's guaranteed to irritate your stomach. So all the newer drugs that I just mentioned above, and there's probably 10 prescription drugs, they were really formulated in order to make it so that your stomach wasn't as bad taking fewer of these medications. So acetaminophen, all right, Tylenol. Uh, it's been out there for a long time. It generally helps with analgesic or pain and it helps lower fevers, but it does not decrease or reduce inflammation of arthritis. So it really doesn't work like that. So a lot of my patients that come in have really not been helped with, the arthritis, with arthritis pain through Tylenol usage. Interestingly, a couple of patients of mine over the last month or so have talked about a new form of Tylenol called rapid release. And uh, there's something different about it because people are saying it works better than what they've tried in the past. So it seems to be a better option now for arthritis than what we've used in the past for it. So glucosamine and chondroitin, all right? So this has been around since 1997 and in the human world, let's say. We took it from the veterinarian world when a book called The Arthritis Cure came out. It came out and talked about this and they've used it in the veterinarian world for 20 years before we started using it. So as soon as the book came out, I found it pretty interesting. So I started giving it out to patients over the years. I found that it really did help about half of my people that tried it. Again, it didn't help the other, it didn't help the other half, but it certainly helped half to be improved. So I started using it in my younger patients with something similar with aches and pains in their knees and about half of them get better as well. So it really doesn't have any side effects. It's relatively safe. It's not regulated by the FDA. <clears throat> Excuse me, you can buy it pretty much anywhere at Costco or Walmart. Amazon I'm sure has it. And the uh, dosage is pretty consistent across all platforms now. So it's something you ought to consider and you can be a pretty happy cat if it works for you. Cortisone injections, all right? One of my favorite slides of all times is looking through the dog in the front and it kind of comes right out the other side. So when we use cortisone, we use it a lot for arthritic, arthritic conditions. In knees, it seems to work pretty well. Um, in hips, it doesn't seem to work as well. And when they've studied it, <clears throat> it looks like the knee has more potential for regeneration than the hip. So knees tend to go for years with me injecting them before they get to knee replacement. Hips do not do that. They may have one shot, maybe two, and then it all of a sudden stops working and you're at hip replacement category. They also help with diagnosis. So hip pain can be mimicked as back pain. So when we do injections, they have a bit of marcaine in them or a numbing agent. And when it numbs the hip, if we find out that it makes them much better, then we've kind of confirmed their problem is their hip and not their back. Therefore, you're not getting some back surgery and your problem really is your hip. 
<clears throat> so here's some uh, what are called gel shots. In my world, we call them visco supplementation. Just a big word for a, like a heavyweight oil for the knee. It's not approved for the hip, never has been, but it's been around 15 or 20 years. Anybody who's gotten a series of injections, this is what they got. And there's probably 20 different products out there on the market. I think we've tried them all over the years. I don't really see appreciable difference between any of them. They all think work pretty consistently. The biggest issue is the more arthritis you get within your knee, the less likelihood they're gonna work. Kind of makes sense to me. Then always physical therapy and exercise. It definitely makes a big difference because the people I've seen over the years, the ones that have better motion in their knees, they are the ones that do better all along the path. If they have good motion, generally they're walking better, they're walking more, they do better with shots, they delay their surgery more, and they do better once they have surgery. So I'm a big advocate for maintaining good mobility. And if any of you guys are patients of mine, you know that. So physical therapy can help us and then you can help yourself by staying flexible. I find heat is probably more valuable than cold because heat helps loosen things. Not many people move to Canada, Canada or Antarctica to, uh, for their arthritis. They really go warm and I think that's a big reason. Again, daily walking and exercise does certainly help. So now those are the kind of the non-surgical things that we do to treat all arthritic patients. When you go through all those steps and now you are ready for surgery, kind of what do we do now? All right. And we're going to kind of discuss the muscle and tendon sparing techniques of hip and knee replacement surgery. So statistically, all right, so uh, three years ago, there were about 300,000 hip replacements done per year and over double that of knee replacement per year. If you look down here by 2030, really only nine years from now, as the baby boomers move into the older population, the hip replacement's gonna have a basically a two-fold increase. And if you look at knees, it's gonna go up to 3.5 million or a five-fold increase. So it's gonna change dramatically over the next 10 years. And even 10 years after that, the curve keeps on going up. So that's why it's important for us to make people as good as we can to make sure when the increased volume occurs that they stay better. So I love this cartoon too. I can't say I'm entirely pleased with my hip replacement. Pretty funny. All right, so we're gonna talk about hips first, all right? And a lot of this stuff you guys may have heard out there, there's different ways to approach your hip replacement. So if we're doing what is written down here as the direct anterior uh, approach to the hip, this is a side view of a left hip. This is kind of the belly as it sits out front. This is down the gluteus or the buttocks region. Anteriorly, the incision sits on the front of your hip. There's a lateral approach, lateral approach, which is straight to the side and posterior means it's towards the back. All right. When we do this approach, we use a special table called the HANA table. And this is a picture of it down here. Basically, they lay on that and their feet go in either one of these boots and it allows us to move the legs independently to move them, rotate them, put traction on them, shorten them, kind of move it where we need to be able to see to do the surgery. All right. The approach has been done for many years. I've done it personally over 10 years uh, in thousands of cases. What the direct anterior uh, approach to total hip replacement shows us is they no question have faster recovery. They certainly have less pain and that's been proven and they do have earlier walking. When we look at the picture here, this is someone laying on their back. There's a bony landmark here and it's, we term it the ASIS. And this is the leg, the foot is down here, the uh, head's up here and the other leg is way over there. So the incision sits right along this line and it's smaller incision than the other one we used to do from the back. The incision on average is probably about three inches. So, so when we do the hip replacement, it's a truly muscle and tendon sparing technique, all right? So you make an incision in the skin like I showed you on the last slide. It's hard to see what this purple, uh, um, uh, interval here is between this muscle and this muscle here. And when you go down to it, you'll see this interval in the hips. And basically you take the two muscles and you separate them. 
I tell them it's a lot like a curtain. You just pull them back, you hold them out of the way, you don't have to cut them, you don't have to cut the tendon. And now you go to the next level, which is now the deep dissection. So you've retracted the top muscle and this one, and it's hard to tell here, but deep is another muscle on either side. So then you take the first one, spread the muscles, you go to the next one, you spread the muscle and tendon, and basically you're really looking right at the hip now, all right? Once you finish the operation, the muscles just come back into position again, and you don't have to suture them because they're back in their anatomic position. So what we've seen over the years as we've been doing this a lot is that they certainly discontinue their walker sooner. They discontinue all aids to walking, including canes or crutches if they use those. The narcotics are discontinued at a quicker pace. They're able to ascend and descend steps earlier, and they have better and quicker early dependent, independent walking, all right? So I mentioned the low, less post-surgical pain. One of the things I think uh, is this no post-operative hip precautions. And if you do an approach from the back side of the hip, a lot of times they'll tell the patients not to sit too low in a chair, don't cross your legs. They tell you all these restrictions they put on you. When you have the hip replaced from the direct anterior approach, we really don't have restrictions. At first it's ice, it's elevation, do your antibiotics, do your pain pills, do your physical therapy. But once you start getting better, and I wrote it down here, the answer to any question is yes. All right. So if you want to do something, I have no restrictions on you. Certainly the dislocation is lower. Uh, I've been doing it, like I said, over 10 years, and I've not had a, a dislocation in a primary hip replacement in the time frame. The incision, as mentioned, is smaller than the approach from the backside. This is incredibly well suited for outpatient procedure, which I've been doing again for 10 years. The, um, the patients will walk quicker and they get out of the uh, surgery center or the hospital at a quicker pace. And then again, I have everybody return to all activities without restrictions. If they wanna play soccer, if they wanna snow ski, they wanna go back to volleyball, they can do all of those things. I don't really mind once they're healed. So that's hip arthritis in kind of a nutshell. This, uh, this part is on knee arthritis, and there's a, we have a few more innovative techniques to try to help people do better with their knee replacements. And the cartoon kind of says, now that's what I call a bum knee, all right? So first off, um, one of the things that we do when we do knee replacement, we don't use a tourniquet any longer, all right? We used to use one long ago, but that's a tourniquet in the picture here. We would take your leg and push the blood out of your leg and blow the tourniquet up. And then we would operate in a bloodless field. What we found out was with the tourniquet on top of your quadriceps muscle, which I'll show you in another slide, it's the main muscle that activates to get your knee moving and have you walking and stair climbing. We found there's a lot of damage from the term called ischemia, which is where the blood is not reaching the muscle itself. So it, it heals over time, but it creates an initial damage that's problematic. If we don't use the tourniquet, we find quicker recovery of this function. There's less narcotic use, and then there's less pain, which goes with the less narcotic use. So we've been doing this surgery without a tourniquet for many years. So I think it's an important way to do it, and you can do it easily this way. Um, next, we've been using a new digital bike, all right? I saw this bike initially of six or maybe even a year now, a long time ago now. They showed it to me. It was a new startup company. And basically the bike is down here in the bottom right. You use your own chair and you adjust your chair for your leg lengths. And then the bike rotates and moves and the screen kind of directs you on movement of your knee. It's about five 15 minute sessions per day that we have patients on right after their knee replacement. It helps them start to move their knee and the bike's interesting because as it moves, the pedals change their dimensions so that it makes you bend more or less. You can increase that as you want. It allows you to kind of change things as it moves along to try to improve your recovery of your knee. I was so impressed. I, was, I really wanted to be part of this. So I was the first to start using this in the area probably about five months ago. Um, I, most of my patients have really liked it. I saw three of them back today and they were quite pleased with the bike use and how it helped them in their recovery process. 
<clears throat> excuse me. So I find that they do have a better range of motion than if you don't use it. They have a faster recovery as well. And I think their experience is better because it's something actually a lot of them look forward to to get on there to get them moving and going. So here's kind of a picture of the, the company called Romtech. And this gentleman sitting in the chair, this device down here on his leg, all right, that is a range of um, uh, uh, a measurement tool for the range of the knee. So it feeds back to the uh, screen here and will tell him how good his range of motion is. We always want your knee to get fully straight and we want as much bend as you can. And this is just another tool that they can see it on the screen and know how they're progressing. So it gives them actual feedback about how well they're doing. So now we're coming down to the uh, ten muscle and tendon sparing technique of knee replacement. The traditional total knee replacement is like we see down here. The incision kind of sits in the midline of the knee in the front. So the skin incision, it really is not the important part of this. The incision could be angled this way. It could be angled that way. It could be off to the side, either side. That's all fine. I prefer the midline. In their world, we call it a utilitarian approach. In other words, if you injure your knee in the future, if you need something future for surgery, well, this incision has been proven to be the best way to re-enter a knee if there's a problem. So I do the same incision on the skin, but what really happens is what we do under the skin to the quadriceps muscle. And that's the difference in the technique that makes such an important change. So here's a, here's a picture of the anatomy. Now you can envision this is a knee that now the skin incision has been made and we're looking at the quadriceps with this is entire muscle that sits in the front of your knee. Here's your kneecap and then your foot would be down farther below here. So once you've made your incision, which is kind of would have been here in the middle, well, you don't stay in the middle. The old incision, we went through this tendon here around the kneecap and then would come down to where it inserts in the lower bone. This is kind of the standard uh, incision, but it does not spare the tendon and does not spare the muscle itself because you separate this muscle away and you separate part of that tendon away, all right? So the technique we talk about is called the subvastus approach, all right? So back to these boring pictures again. So this is what we just saw. This is where it comes to the tendon. You go around the kneecap and back down again. This is kind of an in-between approach that I've done for years, right? Before I moved to the last approach here. This one, you, again, you come up around the kneecap. You don't violate the tendon, but you do go through the muscle, all right? I've changed and done this for many uh, years now. In many cases, we come up around your kneecap about halfway, but then the incision goes here and you, re you attract this muscle, this tendon, and that muscle, and you move the entire muscle group out of the way while you do the surgery. So then now no muscle's been cut and no tendon's been cut, all right? And it is a better way to do it, uh, just like the direct anterior hip replacement. So it's not a new procedure. It's been around for almost a hundred years, all right? But popularized a lot by a guy named Aaron Hoffman in the 1991. He noticed that it wasn't in any of our books. In all of our training books, it was not there. And he was like, why isn't it in our books? It's a good technique and works well. So he kind of pushed the forefront of that and then it's gained popularity about within 10 years of that. And then it's become very popular here in the last five to 10 years, all right? It's been refined over the year. And like I said, I've been doing it a long time and I have seen a big difference in my patient population. So I see less pain, no doubt, quicker recovery of uh, the uh, knee itself with faster return of mobilization, that's of the knee motion and muscle function. So the quadriceps return quicker when you haven't used the tourniquet and you're also not cutting the muscle or tendon. They do have earlier rehabilitation and I think they have more patient satisfaction. They, they feel better about the knee. So the take home points on knee replacement, I think there's a couple. One, no tourniquet. I think that's critical to success. No doubt the subvastus approach, which is muscle and tendon sparing is, is critical because you will get better quicker. And the portable connect ROM tech bike that I've been using, I think makes a big difference. 
We've been doing them outpatient now and gotten progressively so over the last 10 years. Probably now, I want to say 60 to 70% of all my joint replacements, if not more, go home the same day. They do not have to stay in the hospital. And I think a lot of these techniques help pull that off. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So we do have some questions that have come in. I'm just going to read a couple of those off. If you have any questions that you want to ask Dr. Haynes, you still have another moment to get those in. I'm going to go ahead and start with the ones that we have in our queue. Uh, the first one is I'm having knee pain and I've gotten four injections into my knee. It has helped with the arthritis pain, but in two months, the back pain is back or the pain is back. Not there all the time. I'm going to listen to this meeting with Dr. Haynes on February 16th. Uh, but do you have anything to say about, about that? Yeah. So, so the injections, I assume, are cortisone injections, or it could have been one cortisone injection with maybe some of those gel injections. All right. <clears throat> so if that's the case, and they the, the cortisone has to last at least three months, the gel injection should last at least six months. If the, neither one of those are able to last three months or six months, then you're really in the category of knee replacement. As a reminder to my patients that if you don't have enough knee pain, you're not a candidate for knee replacement. There's only one indication for knee replacement, and that's pain that's sufficient enough to change your way of life, and all these interventions do not help you. Perfect. There's a couple more questions coming through. Right. Um, the next one is, do all of the surgeons here use the subvastus approach? So, so one of my partners in here does use the subvastus approach as exclusively of me, and one of them does not do that. All right. And then also I see uh, uh, along the knee replacement surgery itself, right, probably takes about an hour. So total time is four or five hours from the time you get to the hospital, get to the surgery center, get it done, and are able to leave. But the actual surgery itself, once we can get going, is about an hour. And I see a question about the digital bike. All right. So the bike is ordered on every one of my patients. Uh, anybody who can get it, I want to get it. All right. So so we ordered on everybody. There's, that's not a question. It's just something I ordered standard. Perfect. For the, the bike itself, you said you can get it before the surgery? Yes. Though, so what we end up doing is we, we keep a bike in my physical therapy department. All right. They did not have one for me to do as a demo, if you will. So I just got that probably a week and a half ago after I requesting it. So it's in my therapy that you can kind of go over there and actually do a visit of prehab and get on the bike, see what it's like and understand it. If you don't do it, which is what we've been doing for a long time anyway, Kelvin, one of the guys with Romtech calls you and if your surgery is on a Wednesday, let's say, and you go home, he either brings it out Wednesday and gets you started on that day or Thursday. He sets it up in your place, gets it all done. He sets it up and shows you how to use it and you start using it. There's a way you can call the company if there's problems. You can call the, uh, the representative of the company locally as well. So they've been really responsive to patients that have issues. That's great. How long on average are you out of work? And this question doesn't have anything specific if it's knee or hip, right. but let's talk about both of those. All right. So, so with hip replacement, I think the average return to work in all occupations is about four weeks. All right. Um, in knee replacement, it takes you longer to get there. So between six and eight weeks to get back to most things. If you're in the telework right now, you can probably cut those times in half, all right? Because a lot of times you can do those things um, uh, through remotely without having to worry about getting around and getting to work, et cetera. Okay. Uh, the next question is, do most orthopedic surgeons not use the tourniquet? You know, I think that a lot of the guys that are doing knee replacement in a high volume, in other words, they see a lot of patients, they treat a lot of patients, are not using the tourniquet because they see the benefits. I think if you're not doing a lot of these, that they probably still use it because it gives them a comfort without worrying about the bleeding that occurs during the surgery. New question just came in. It says, how often do you do the bilateral knee replacements and what is the criteria for that? So, so on bilateral knee replacements, what that means is you're doing both knee replacements at the same time. I am not a fan of that, all right? Uh, if somebody really wants that in my practice, I'll refer them to another physician. My worries are the data shows that if you end up doing both your knees at the same time, you'll probably get yourself a blood transfusion, all right, which does not occur if you do them independently. 
and the risks go from 1% with one knee to close to 3% if you do both knees. So there's more risk involved and also you're gonna get a blood transfusion. So my preference is I do your worst knee first and then two to three months later, if you're ready to do the next one, we do that. Or I've seen one in four people not need the second surgery at that point in time and can delay it down the road. Very nice. Do you recommend using the portable cooling machine for knee replacements? So I remember using that portable cooling machine. You can buy them on Amazon now pretty cheap uh 30 years ago all right we liked it a lot we thought it worked great the trouble is the insurance companies have had a real problem paying for it and i've had a lot of indigestion trying to get patients to pay out of pocket the initial ones were probably a thousand plus dollars um so the newer ones and i know my patients have bought them off amazon i think they're 150 bucks that you buy it and it's yours forever so uh, patients have bought it and kept it themselves. And I think it's kind of come down in price and made it much more reasonable. All right, I think we have one more question here. And um, there's, if you straighten my leg at the knee, there's a lady who was born with uh, her leg turned in. She said, if you straighten at the, the leg at the knee, I won't be able to walk. Um, so she needs her ligaments and tendons in the same spot. Is that possible? Can you address some of those concerns? Right. So, so it's a little uh, uh, deceiving when they say the, I was born with my leg turning in because uh, the turning in is typically going to be at the hip. All right. The knee itself can bow or it can be knock kneed and you want to correct that because it has to be corrected at the time of the surgery to get your leg straight. So the rotation leg could be mainly hip. That would be something I'd have to check out from exam and with uh, x-rays as well. What type of knee implant do you use and how long do they last? So uh, there's two different implants I use, all right? I've used the Depew Attune and that's A-T-T-U-N-E. Implants been out six, seven years now. It's kind of the, uh, uh, the remake of the one they had before that. So it's a better product. I also use the Smith & Nephew Journey 2, all right? And both those products and a lot of the knee systems that have come out in the last seven, eight years are better systems than I had 20 years ago. I didn't think they'd be that much better, but they are a dramatic improvement. So they work great. And I would tell you at 20 years of date of implantation for knee replacements, I think the success rate should be 97, 96% that you shouldn't need anything else done to that knee. And I see, I see one more question here. It says, if uh, I went to VMI, will I get equal treatment? I will put your knee in backwards. That is for sure. <laughs> uh, I think that's the end of our questions for this evening. Um, thank you everyone at home for those questions. I really appreciate you getting in and um, answer, asking those so that everybody can benefit from that. Uh, I know everybody at home has several questions. So that's fantastic. Uh, this evening's lecture has been very informative. Uh, from Dr. Haynes. So thank you so much for your time this evening. If you would like to learn more about Dr. Haynes to see article he's, articles he has written about hips and knees and other topics, um, to make an appointment with him, you can visit our website at osc-ortho.com. You can also call our office here at 757-596-1900. We're conveniently located in Newport News in the Port Warwick area, and we're open Monday through Friday from 8 to 5. If you have any more questions, please feel free to submit those. Again, it's osc-ortho.com or 757-596-1900. Thank you, everyone, and have a great evening. Yeah, have a great night.